You are listening to Value Engine's Magnet Minutes, hosted by Jordan Kemmel, a podcast for investors to tune into the markets and stay informed. Welcome to Magnet Minutes. I'm Jordan Kimmel, and here's an update for Thursday, December 30th already. And today we're going with a special guest. We're bringing in her blank, the senior quantitative analyst at Value Engine, a longtime friend and colleague, and frankly, one of the reasons I joined Value Engine. And uh, Herb, we're going to get into a blog that you wrote that, that received a lot of attention because everyone's so income starved right now and we want them to look in the right direction. But just to set the stage again, uh, Herb, you do a lot of blogging for Value Engine. You're the senior quantitative analyst. And for about 20 years now, Value Engine has been scoring individual companies and with your help, ETFs. Um, and so you go to valueengine.com to take a look at it. And uh, because of your insight and because of our reputation and, and uh, because of our relationship, I've joined Value Engine Capital, which we'll get into a little bit uh, after that. But Herb, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, so your, your latest blog, I saw got a tremendous amount of attention. And uh, I'm going to let you just tee it right up and jump right into what the discussion was all about. Right. And I, I, it's actually sort of a two-part blog. The first blog is more conventional and focuses on the inadequacy of VOO or the 10-year T-bill to, to provide any kind of decent yield. VOO, uh, which is the S&P 500, which is the ultimate passive investment, has 1.3% uh, yield income. Its specialty is growth, and although many people think the growth may have hit a high point right now, but that's another story. But it, and the 10-year T-bill uh, yield is only a paltry 1.5%. So there are a lot are turning to dividend ETFs, many of which have higher yields. And one of the uh, uh, the most popular of the this group, VY, uh, VYD, the Vanguard uh, yield e ETF, which just simply puts together the, the uh, top 100 yielding stocks and cap weights them, uh, gives you 2.6% yield and so-so uh, capital gains and a, a fair amount of risk. The one I like much better, the second most popular one is a Schwab product, SCHD. It yields nearly 3%. It has a very competitive total return to the S&P 500. It, it equally weights their components and it uses, it doesn't just look at yield, but it looks like at the components that would be needed to sustain the yield of these companies. So it's higher quality companies. I know quality is a factor that Magnet looks at as well. So no doubt. Uh, so if you're looking for anything passive to supplement, the SCHD is a pretty good choice. And those who need income in their core could move some from the S&P 500 to SCHD. Now, another one I looked at, SDOG, uh, which takes uh, has a nice methodology I like where they take it. Uh, each quarter, the 10 load, uh, highest yielding stocks in every sector in the S&P. And then having selected those stocks uh, 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 equally weights them and then repeats the process, uh, gives you a 3.5% yield and has done well the last year for uh, capital appreciation, but it's much more, again, much more volatile. So if right. income is your thing and, and conservative and something that's an alternate core, my recommendation for those people using ordinary stocks is SCHD. Someone came back to me and said, what about SYLD, which is a global X product that's super dividend, uh, DIV rather, which is an, uh, called the super dividend yield ETF which is a global X product. I looked at that and yeah, it has a 5.6% yield, which is higher than any of the ones I mentioned, but has terrible capital appreciation and a lot of volatility. But I looked, if what if income is your only thing that you're looking at? And that was the second part of the block. And I found four ETFs that had better yields than DIV, the global X product, but did not use ordinary stocks. 
So it, uh, there is a caveat in using any of the ones I'm about to talk about. And that is if you have tax consequences, you have uh, you know always read the prospectus before purchasing, it, purchasing any of these things, or at least the summary prospectus or the fact sheet. And if, you're, if taxable income is one of your concerns, uh, make sure you discuss this with a tax advisor or, or, or research the tax consequences yourself, because there are some. The, uh, the first of these uh, is a uh, REI, and all of these include some sort of investment trust or the last you'll see derivatives. So the first one does REIT, it's a Van Eck product, VKYW, it yields 5.8%, it yields towards real estate income uh, trust. It's very variable year to year, how much is made on that. And this last year, it, it, it's done quite well, but the last five years, not as well. Right, but that one, again, is focused more on the real estate side, so it's a little bit less sector diversified. Right, exactly. All of these are, except for the last one, which is the highest yielding I'll get to, are non-sector diversified. And really, QYLD isn't that sort of sector diversified either, but it's got a lot of positive points. Uh, the next one to talk about it is... Uh, PCEF. PCEF is very interesting. It owns closed end funds. And it is rather diversified among income producing fixed income closed end funds, including option income, including uh, government income, including uh, uh, specialty uh, uh, fixed income, uni income. It's got, got a direct array of fixed income e ETFs. And it was uh, the methodology was developed by two closed end fund analysts, one who used to be with Morgan Stanley and one who used to be with Merrill Lynch in selecting the quality, selecting the ones that will maintain uh, total return. It's an Alarian S network index. It's a uh, PCF is an Invesco product. It has a 40 basis point fee, which is a lot higher than the six basis point fee of uh, uh, SCHD, but in the scheme of things, these fees are small enough that you really want to see what, what suitability, I believe, is more important than the fees, suitability to the investor. And uh, PCEF gives you a nice income stream, has, has a fairly low volatility because of the nature of it's what, what's in there. It's well diversified. Now these are this is closed end fund income, so for the most part it's passed through. And since the pass through it's using our, our fixed income closed end funds, this is probably one of the cleaner ones we're talking about. Here. Okay, uh, it's it's yield is six point nine, which is considerably higher than DIV and certainly the others we talked about. But we have two that are higher. One is BIZD. Is and BIZD is uh, what's called B BDCs or business development companies. It's Van Eck, which is an expert in selecting such companies. It's uh, an algorithmic actively managed fund that I call it. And that, that's true of all of these that I'm talking about now. I don't consider if you're doing a strategy that's been developed by an active manager, even if it's rules-based, that to be passive. Passive is the is VOO, the S&P 500. Right. <laughs> no question. This, this is not passive. Uh, Vanek uh, turns over the portfolio about 35% a quarter. There are high management fees associated with it, but it does uh, create a, a, uh, a yield of nearly 9%. And its total return last year was 38%. Again, its five-year total return, though, has been all over the map, uh, is, is, the, is the fourth highest of the ones we looked at. And it, 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 it was the most volatile of, of the funds here. And business development company income uh, may, may not fit qualifications for the lowest income bracket. Okay, Herb, well, let me just share that. Uh, and, you, go ahead, you, want, you want to bring out one more, I think, right? Yes. And this is, this is the one I, I, along with PCEF, I encourage everybody to take a look at. It's QYLD. The core, the stocks it owns, it owns the same 100 stocks as QQQ. It owns the NASDAQ 100 with all its strengths it's had the last five years and all the potential uh, potential risk for it. There you go. What's the dividend on that one, Herb? The dividend on QYLD, believe it or not, is 11.3%. But, but here's the hook. 
That's correct. It's 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 really a very conservative strategy. It's it's following, and it goes back to bank trust departments in the seventies, even before these things existed. And that's called buy right. A buy right strategy buys the the stocks and sells the covered calls. What was also discovered over the years is that index covered calls tend to uh, uh, overestimate volatility and sell richer than what they are. So when you're writing a color, color call, you take advantage of this uh, anomaly. So th this, th what this has done basically is uh, preserve the capital that's in there and take all the gains that you would normally have on the uh, in terms of of uh, the uh, other capital appreciation and turns it into income for you. So you've you've got an 11.3% income stream right now. And, and actually the uh, income stream has been in double digits since the uh, uh, fund has come out. So it's pretty reliable. The uh, capital of it is low volatility. It's not going to give you growth. It's an income producing vehicle, right. but it's not going to lose you growth either as some would, would would, uh, right, the they're not they're not stealing from one pocket to put in the other, and and I and I looked at that one. That's the one I believe you called your queen. If yes, you, if the king if the king is income, that was your queen, right? Precisely correct. Right. So Herb, you know, let me just share that you covered a lot. I think what what's really impressive is the in depth research that you do and the quantitative factors that you look at in every investment. And again. Um, there's no recommendations being made here. There's uh, an, an encouragement instead to do some homework, maybe talk to an advisor if you're using one, uh, maybe even Herb, I think that one of the uh, strengths of Value Engine is that you do make yourself available uh, from time to time when people call in. Absolutely. 100%. Right? So, so I, I would suggest to folks to, to take a look at um, the, the, the most interesting thing, Herb, I've seen uh, in the last 20 years is all the choices of ETFs that have come out. Um, a lot of them have done real well. A lot of them uh, need to be stacked up against each other in order to really do a fine analysis. Yes, ETFs have a more efficient structure. And one of the big events of the last two, three years was the ETF rule of 2019 and the approval of the S&P of semi-transparent ETF trading structures, where you don't have to give the whole store away. Those two <laughs> in combination have brought active managers in droves into it, plus the moves from investors for tax efficiency, for other efficiencies for into ETFs. So now, now all of a sudden you've got T. Rowe Price, you've got Capital Group, you've got American Century, Dimensional Fund Advisors, people who uh, wanted nothing to do with ETFs for 20 years coming out of the woodwork and putting out ETFs. And I don't say there's anything bad about it. It's good. If, if right. they want to offer these active managed manage products, why not put them in, into a structure that doesn't force a manager to manage the cash flows? Right. Now, let me say for the record, Herb, you are one of the first, earliest, and I think most knowledgeable in the ETF industry. And one of the things that ETFs showed up and, and came about was the opportunity not only for tax advantage instead of mutual funds, but for individuals to capture an aspect of the market without single stock risk. And what I want to bring up here right now is uh, I myself really believe in the income side, and I have, as we've discussed, joined Value Engine Capital to bring separately managed accounts available for the individual. And, and Herb, just like ETFs were just simply not available to the public many years ago, separately managed accounts weren't suitable for investors with less than a million dollars because of commission charges for an active manager. And all that has changed. Absolutely. One of the reasons the index fund was developed way back from the beginning was they tried first to do equally weighted tranches of the New York Stock Exchange. 
and they were getting killed by the transaction costs of the day. It used to cost a nickel a share or more to, to trade stocks and, and they were getting killed. So they went to something that doesn't change with the trades age day with the prices of the stock. So that's why it was so uh, impressive and so efficient at the time to go to a cap weighted index, which the S&P 500 was sitting there very quietly and, and all of a sudden became the first cap weighted index and the, and, and, and the first to have index funds uh, balanced to it. And once index funds became popular with institutions, uh, the move came and they eventually became the uh, go-to for options. And that's, that, that has, is what enmeshed the S&P 500 as basically the son of the uh, ETF universe, uh, of the uh, investment universe. And ETFs have captured a lot of those efficiencies, but that, but the one thing that's happened since then is, and you're getting to technology, technology, technology. And now SMAs are much less expensive because you're not paying that much for shares. You're not uh, having problems with execution. You're, you don't need a huge staff to manage cash and all that kind of thing. Right. So, le so let me share, Herb, if I may, the value engine capital dividend increase separately managed account. And what I manage there is using all the powers of the magnet stock selection process that is looking for the strongest balance sheets, the most stable actual earnings. Uh, we also bring in the facts model, which looks for the most trustworthy companies. And then we have one more layer, which is only looking at companies that pay a dividend and a dividend above S&P. So Herb, what we have right now is a plus 30 stock portfolio that's diversified among all industries. They do have business development corporations in there and helps the yield. The current yield is about 4.4%. But I think that the difference, Herb, between what I'm doing and what a lot of other folks do is rather than look for the highest dividend, I'm looking for companies that increase their dividend every year and have a very strong dividend coverage rate above the dividend so that we know or we think we anticipate, even in challenging times, the dividend is not only going to deliver, but the dividend over time is going to increase. And so this is something, as you know, I've been running for a couple different uh, registered investment advisors over the last couple of years with great success. And it's really a pleasure now to be doing at Value Engine Capital. I think it's fantastic. Uh, you had one of the best quant books on factor research and looking at companies that I've known over the last 20 years in the Magnet Investing book. I, I, I still have that in my library as well, your an autographed copy. And uh, facts when you developed it, uh, to me, I liked because it combined that with some risk control, because when you're talking trustworthiness, when you're talking so the social aspects and the governance aspects of a company, you're getting to the soul of a corporation. And these are the companies that are going to be more proactive than reactive. And, you know, and that's sort of what you're trying to bring, ideally, with an active manager, is the ability to control the risk by being on top of what changes are happening, what that means for a corporation, what kind of turnover, are you losing intellectual property, are you communicating that to your clients, you know. Uh, you know, I think, I think you hit it on the head, and again, in full disclosure, Herb, over 20 plus years ago, you did a back test on Magnet. Uh, I think it raised some eyebrows back then because it was one of the first to really blend value, growth, and momentum at the time. Uh, we've been colleagues and friends ever since. And so now at Value Engine Capital, I'm not only managing the Magnet model, which is really intended for the highest level of growth, which has volatility, I'm also managing the facts model itself, which I think you've just shared, really lends itself to the ESG school of thought and really was developed before ESG became the buzzword that it is. Uh, and, and for those investors looking for income, and there's a lot of income starved investors right now with the bank at 1%, treasuries at 1%, we have the dividend increase model. All three models, as you say, Herb, 
available where we do not pay any transaction costs, buying and selling. It's a modest management fee and you see your portfolio at night. Uh, just look at the account and open it uh, whenever you'd like. So Herb, I want to really thank you for the time here right now. I think what we do know is that uh, your blogs are some of the most read blogs on Wall Street. Uh, and I think this one with the, the dividend and has captured more attention and more interest in almost any blog I've seen in a couple of years. So stick with it. Let me wish you a happy, a healthy new year and many years of working together ahead at Value Engine and Value Engine Capital. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Jordan. All righty, Herb. We'll talk to you real soon. Folks, this is another extended Magnet Minutes. I'm Jordan Kimmel, and we're looking for the informed investor. Thank <laughs> you.